Thank you. It's, it's a delight to be here, although I have to say, um, go Nats. This is why I'm wearing red. Anyone else here a Nats fan? All right. You know, back in D.C., everyone's still wearing red. I, I, I was looking around like, surely there are some others. But anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And as I was walking over, it's a, it's a bit warmer in Virginia than it is here. So the song came to mind, Baby, It's Cold Outside. And I'm sure you've heard a little bit of the uh, kerfuffle that's been going on about that song. It was an Oscar-winning uh, song back from the late 40s. And it drew a lot of criticism. It's always played around this time of year. And it's a, a song that is uh, sort of a, about it, a seduction, basically. But anyway, it's drawn the ire of those who say this violates or is an example of lack of sexual consent, and that therefore this song should not be played. And so consent can fix everything. So two singers, John Legend and Kelly Clarkson, redid the lyrics. So they came up with some different lyrics. They said, uh, changing the responses so that you get a different feel for this. So where one, the woman says, I really can't stay, he says, Baby, it's cold outside. And she says, I've got to go away. And he says, I can call you a ride, instead of saying stay. And she says, what will my friends think? Well, I think they should rejoice that you're going home. And then she says, I ought to say no, no. And then he says, well, then you really ought to go, go, go. So the, the chorus then is, uh, with her saying, I really can't stay. And he says, I understand, baby. <laughs> so it's drawn a lot of criticism for not quite having the lyrical uh, <laughs> melody here. <laughs> but it, it's interesting. I won't read you the second verse. Maybe we'll refer to it later. But the tone is not quite the same in the, in the second verse. But I think this shows something about the mentality of today, where there's a lot of happy talk about consent that sexual consent can fix everything. If you just get the consent piece right, your relationships are going to be good. There won't be sexual assault. We won't have this, this climate of, of sexual harassment that holds women back and, and uh, brings out the worst in men, so the, the thinking goes. So this kind of happy talk about sexual consent, I'm sure you're all familiar with, because every college in the country puts college students through consent training as part of their orientation or at different benchmarks in their college career, every, every secular college. And I see this, I work a lot on education issues, K through 12, and this is rippling down through high schools, elementary schools, and there's now even a board book for children who cannot read, so their parents can read to them this book, C is for consent where it's teaching the child this fundamental idea that they are in charge of their body and nobody gets to touch it or tell them what to do with it unless they give consent. So all I could think of was having raised seven kids. There are times when you have to do things that they don't want to do. And I, I, you know, putting kids in charge of themselves like that is, is kind of a, a problem. But there are other things. There are videos, and, and this is incorporated into comprehensive sex ed. Uh, just communicating this idea that what really will make our relationships right is if we understand we are all autonomous beings and that we are in charge. Uh, there's a kindergarten video out there, I'm the boss of my body. It's actually kind of catchy if you want to look it up on, on YouTube. But it's just this whole thing, I'm the boss of my body. And that's, that's the mentality. So that all our sexual relationships then should be fine. If we're just respected as the boss of our bodies and we're willing to assert that and demand that respect, well then we should all be able to go home. There's no more discussion here. Why would we worry about things not going right in terms of sexual relationships. Shouldn't consent solve the problem by giving autonomy and empowerment and that sense of control? Well, let's take stock 
I think it's important to wonder first, are we asking the right questions? If you're talking about sex, why, why are you talking about sex? What do you mean by that? Is sex a physical act all that a person really wants? Or do they want love? Do they want marriage? Do they want uh, a permanent relationship? What does the human heart hunger for? Are we just like animals? Just have an urge, you go scratch that urge and, and move on. No, sex is something more. But our consent culture does not stop and ask those questions. It does not pose those questions to young people. Instead, it offers this view, this happy talk, that sexual consent will solve everything. I think it's important to keep some of those questions in mind. What do we want? What is sex? What's the meaning of love? What's, what's marriage all about? Um, and to ask whether the consent culture is really fostering what we're looking for or whether it's actually counterproductive. For those young people in the room, most of you, um, I wanna sort of look back a little bit and explain how we got here. Because for many of you, just this whole idea of sexual consent being, being uh, such a big deal probably crossed your radar uh, with the Harvey Weinstein scandal, right? You're just, all of a sudden this blew up and it's like, well, what was the problem? What was, what was going wrong in male-female relationships? What, what's the meaning here? Especially since with, with that case, there was so much talk about how everyone knew that this man was exploiting people, was raping people, was, was uh, at least allegedly, um, you know, was committing all these violations, treating people really badly. So how could this happen in a culture as advanced as ours? In a culture that is taught so openly about sex and sexual relationships and even consent for so many years. Again, most, most colleges have had consent programs in place for well over a decade. So what's going on here? I think part of the reason why there was so much consternation was the response from the men who were accused in the wake of the Me Too situation because so many of the first reactions were non-apologies. They were things like this. Harvey Weinstein said, uh, this was sort of one of his early tries at apologizing, he said, the way I've behaved has caused a lot of pain. Good, good to acknowledge. I sincerely apologize for it. Good. Then he says, I'm trying to do better. I know I have a long way to go. In other words, the project is me. It's not about healing others. Russell Simmons, who was also accused, his explanation was this. The culture is going through a time of great transition. I will commit myself to continuing my personal growth, my spiritual learning, and above all, to listening. What's he saying there? He's saying he did all these things because, well, maybe he's hard of hearing, right? He didn't, he didn't quite hear what these women were saying. Al Franken in politics, his apology was something like this. Some women have found my greetings or embraces for a hug or a photo inappropriate, and I respect their feelings about that. I feel terribly that I've made some women feel badly. Translation, it's women's sensitivity that's the problem. And then finally, Louis C.K., who said at the time, and he was accused of exposing himself, and he said, at the time, when he was doing these things, I said to myself that what I did was okay because I never showed a woman my genitals without asking first, which is also true. That should raise some questions. That's actually a true statement. But his excuse there is, don't change the rules. Okay, this is how the game's been played. I asked and nobody said no, or nobody ran from the room. So what's going on here? One of the reasons why the Harvey Weinstein um, situation and, and all that followed drew such attention was because he busted the myth about the sexual revolution. He, he exposed the lie that we can have sexual relations without consequences. And we've already seen that discussion or heard that discussion in terms of the abortion debate. 
But when people talk about the consequences of sexual relationships without love, without fidelity, without commitment, they usually talk about it in, in sort of measurable terms. How many people get pregnant? How many STIs are there? Maybe is there, are there mental health repercussions, particularly for women? But we don't talk about what it does to the human heart and how it changes our view, not just of ourselves, but of the other people we're engaging with. And not even those that we actually engage with, perhaps in a sexual way, but those who we look at, those who are in our horizon. How do we view men and women? All of these things have been affected by everything that has occurred but Weinstein sort of blew the cover off of it because everyone was, was pretending in many respects that things were going along just fine. You know, but for the pregnancy issue, okay, but pregnancy rates are coming down. You know, but for those things, everything's fine with this new sexual transactional uh, mechanism. There was one writer for NBC who said, who put her finger on something else. She said, 50 years after the summer of love, which is what the 60s and, and this, when the sexual revolution kicked off, 50 years after the summer of love with its bright promises for women of release from repression, greater power over our destinies, and more choices in our sexual lives, the country now stumbles through the winter of discontent. Many of those promises are marked undelivered. Okay, this is from someone who was invested in defending the sexual revolution. And yet, the whole Me Too situation forced people, or forced out into the open, these concerns that women have had, that men have had, that people have been experiencing, that something is not right in how we are relating around the issue of sex. So what went wrong? And what's the solution? How did we go from the 1960s ideals of sort of universal love and uh, to a culture where so many people feel numbed, sexually degraded, and yet do the happy talk of sexual consent? Yeah, you got it, everything's good. So I think it, it helps to, again, look back a little bit and, and look at feminism. And I'm not talking here about what I would call opportunity feminism because I, I think there isn't anyone in the room who doesn't think it's a good thing that women can make their own contracts, can attend a school like this, can have a career, can, can uh, you know, forge their own, their own future. And yet, along with that good, radical feminism brought in some other things that have been really problematic, especially for women. What did women want? Equality. And again, equality of opportunity, fine. But equality too often was defined in male terms, and particularly in speaking about sexuality. It was true there was a double standard, that men often slept around, and, and yet if a woman had sex before she was married, or had sex if not just with one person but a couple, her, her reputation was trashed. So there was this double standard that women, I think, rightly rebelled against, and yet instead of asking men to step up and to, to, um, to be better, to live with integrity, to live with respect and commitment, with a deeper understanding of what sexuality is about. Women went chasing for what it was men were doing. And I see this in other areas of feminism, and I won't go into all the things, but there's sort of, there was sort of a deep insecurity there that we could not, as women, stand up and say, we need to be respected as women. And we will define the future and we will define what we need on our terms, acknowledging that difference between men and women. Instead, we let the, the path be dictated according to what appeared to be good or desirable for men. So what else did feminists want? Freedom. And freedom was defined in terms of, of being loosed from moral restraints. Some of you, if you're reading history, uh, may or, or looking at images from the 70s, you may find pictures of feminists burning bras and, and things like that. What was the symbolism there? 
That was a symbol of moral restraint. Not that bras actually have anything to do with moral restraint, but it was symbolic. This was getting rid of patriarchy. It was getting rid of morality, all those things that were holding women back. So freedom was conceived not in terms of, of uh, being able to pursue the good, but rather being free from any sort of moral constraints and the desire instead to be able to just decide for yourself what was good. And so good became redefined instead of good being the common good, good being what, what contributes to human flourishing in light of who we are and what we're called to. And as religious believers, those of you who are religious believers, we see that, that good, in terms of our ultimate good, that we're called to eternal life. We're not simply a bunch of, of atoms, or as, as I've read recently in a, um, a queer theory thing, we're not simply a, an assemblage of, of different parts. You know, there's something deeper to who we are as human beings. And yet good was redefined as simply pleasure, as simply choice, as getting what I want. And this, all of this was well before we got, really got into the sexual consent culture, but it laid the groundwork. It's a way of thinking about who we are. It's a way of thinking about relationships. It's a way of thinking and judging what is good. So good becomes what is pleasurable. And freedom is freedom from oppression. And for those radical feminists, oppression was defined in terms of biology. So you had Simone de Beauvoir talking about how motherhood left women riveted to her body like an animal. Betty Friedan found the home to be something that women needed to be freed from, that motherhood was limiting, that work was so much better, and certainly work is fulfilling, but yet for her it was one or the other. Shulamith Firestone, some of you, if you've read uh, books from that era, 1970, she wrote The Dialectic of Sex. She was a, a Marxist feminist, and for her, freedom, the freedom from oppression was freedom from sexual difference freedom from the biological difference of male and female. She actually envisioned, way back when in 1970, she envisioned a future for women where uh, reproduction would be outsourced, where you could do things like IVF and surrogacy and things like that, even though there was no technology. And then she, part of her envisioning was that men would then be able to uh, carry babies or would have to carry babies because she felt that was oppressive. And then finally, freedom from the oppression of sex with men. There was a strain of those radical feminists for whom men, because many of them had been injured and found men to be oppressive and, and not respectful of their dignity, they felt that their freedom lay in being freed from sex with men. So that phrase, all men are rapists, Andrea Dworkin uh, publicized. So what happened? We went from sort of the angry feminists and the, the trying to overthrow all these oppressive elements in society to the late 90s, sex in the city, sexy sex is back. It's not just about making a political statement. And then from there in the late 1990s, early um, part of the 2000s, sex became part of the measure of empowerment, particularly for women. And so a lot of the rhetoric of those times talked about women being able to make choices, women being able to decide that they can choose casual sex if they want to. They can choose an abortion. They can choose uh, to leave their marriage. They can choose all these things. That that sense of, of personal choice must be unquestioned. That if I'm choosing, it's therefore a good choice. You know that phrase, trust women? In fact, I was, I was driving today in, um, in the district and there was a Virginia car with a Virginia license plate in front of me that said Roe-Wade. And I looked, I didn't even know Virginia had a, a, a pro-choice license plate, but underneath it said, trust women, trust women. What does that actually say? It says, any choice I make because I'm a woman is therefore good? That's, that's kind of demeaning. That, that kind of, it, it's rather patronizing to presume women can do no wrong because we're, we're simply women. Don't question us, don't look too deeply 
that's ridiculous. You know, we're, we're human beings. We make the same mistakes as, as everyone else. But for, for feminism, this became part of the mantra. And so the consent ethic began to take hold, rooted in these ideas. And so consent, people thought, would give women in particular that sexual freedom that they wanted. Now you might say, well, what about men? What were they doing during all this? Men felt like they won the lottery, right? Because many men were very happy to have more sex and less commitment. And so indeed, that's what we've seen as women who traditionally had been sort of the, the gatekeepers because we have more to lose from casual sex. As women did less of that, we've seen the marriage age grow, go up. We've seen men, um, some men, certainly not the men in this room, become video gamers till the age of 33. And I'm not talking about video gamers who invent the next great, you know, something or other, but, but people who, who literally can't get out of their seats and, and order out Uber Eats all the time. They keep Uber Eats in business. You know, so this whole um, relationship between men and women has gotten very strange in many respects. And again, for women, it's, the consent ethic builds on that sense of empowerment and to the extent it seems to fail, and again, for the past 10 years, this has been part of a discussion before Harvey Weinstein. People said, wait a minute, something's not going on here. A lot of the conversation in feminist circles was about power. Well, if women just had more power, if women were in charge, these relationships would be more equal and you would not have these issues. You would not have harassment. And maybe we need to be more specific about what consent means. And so the concept of affirmative consent was born. And again, some of you may have experienced that in, in your programs, in your schools. And consent, sexual consent, is kind of a big business. There's a lot of training programs out there. There are a lot of producers of consent materials, games, interactive things. Again, not just for college, but for grade school, all the way on down the line. There's surveys, there's data. Consent is sort of big business. But what's it doing for us? Is it really helping us find deep relationships? Is it really making sex more pleasurable, more enjoyable, more filled with love? Does it contribute to human flourishing? Well, in a very basic sense, sexual consent is necessary. I'm all in favor of it, right? You don't want anyone being engaged in sexual activity without their consent. But it is a minimalistic standard. It's a legal minimum. And yet we've adopted this as the parameter, the defining um, uh, nature of a good, healthy sexual relationship. It's all good as long as there's sexual consent. And so what we see is a transactional relationship. And I see this even in talking with married women. Because when you think a certain way, and when you begin to engage in sexual relationships in a certain way with a transactional mentality, you don't just shed that because you found someone who, who you really love. You've got habits, habits of how you view the other person, habits of how you engage them, habits that you bring to that sexual relationship, which means those habits create problems in marriages. But back to the notion of consent for a minute. I said it, was, it has become very transactional to the point that um, because colleges are still struggling, there are still reports of sexual harassment, sexual assault. Why isn't this consent thing working? Well, if we can't do affirmative consent, yes means yes. How about consent contracts? And so there are, there are schools that have that. And, and there's one... Um, that I, I actually thought was kind of amusing. This, this consent contract was put out by this new company that instructs a couple when they're together that they need to, to follow the parameters of this consent contract by first taking a picture of you and your partner together holding this contract. And then you can fill out the form front and back. But if you decide not to, Go through all of this. this, the instructions read, please take this moment to agree to have consensual sex with each other. Yes means yes. And then sort of a PS, always use protection, use a condom. <laughs> 
So what does that tell us about a relationship? Can you imagine you know, being in a relationship where you're going to pull out this you know, piece of paper, sign here, please, you know, and, and the, the instructions, again, in most of these training programs, remind people you can't take consent for granted. So at every stage, get this affirmative consent. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? It's not a human interaction. It betrays what the nature of sex is all about. It betrays the dignity of the human person. And that's why it's not working. Because sex is meant to be something more. So again, the culture is trying to fill in and we, we went from sort of affirmative consent to everything's sex positive plus consent. It must be that our attitudes are not sufficiently positive enough towards sexuality. And why, why is this the uh, sort of the, the new thinking? Because women are unhappy. And even about a year and a half before the uh, Harvey Weinstein thing broke. There were a number of articles in, in women's publications and in um, a New Yorker magazine talking about how women were unfulfilled. Women were complaining, they were unhappy because they were getting consent, but the sex was bad sex. And so they're scratching their heads and saying, what is going wrong with this? And there were Researchers who did research and, and decided that, yeah, you've got consent, but lots of really bad sex because there's an orgasm gap, that men are having more pleasure than women, so women need to lean in, just like with Sheryl Sandberg and leaning in in the corporate culture, that women can solve these problems by leaning in and demanding what we need. Again, what's wrong with this picture? It sees sex as something transactional. It does not acknowledge the depth of the human heart. It does not acknowledge what sex is really all about and what it's meant to convey. It trivializes sex and, and makes it so thin it breaks. It, it, it can't possibly stand and, and hold up to, to the promises. So with this as background, then we had the Harvey Weinstein scandal. Right? So do you get the picture? There's a lot of turmoil, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of things not working right, and people grasping and trying to understand why isn't sexual consent good enough? And then the Harvey Weinstein thing broke, and we're sort of back to the same thing, with the suggestions being, well, power disparity. That's really the root of it. Except that women cooperated in covering these things up, too. So it was more than that. Well, we didn't, we didn't enforce the consent. We didn't know how to ask for it. We didn't know how to verbalize it. So now there are studies talking about how, well, it's true. There are all different ideas of what verbalizing consent means. So there's this growth industry of research all around sexual consent in hopes of discovering something that's going to make transactional sex fulfilling. It's failing. It will fail because the human heart is not made for that kind of relationship. The human being is not made to be treated as a, as a thing, as something to be used. Human heart is made for love. The human person is made for dignity, has dignity, no matter what. And one of the things that's been problematic here and that makes things confusing for people is that consent can't solve all sorts of of issues. For example, what happens if a woman consents to something that's inherently degrading? Is that okay? Do we, if, if sexual consent is all there is, if that's really all that matters, should we have a problem with that? Well, a lot of women didn't have a problem with it. When Fifty Shades of Grey came out, the popularized, brutal, violent sex, women were the main consumers of the books and the movies. Why is that? Why is that? Because of the mentality of sexual consent. As long as I say it's okay, that makes it not degrading when it's really degrading. That, that makes the pain okay. And it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> 
Um, I have a, a friend that I know who's a GYN at a major teaching hospital in the South. And she talks about what she sees in her clinics dealing with adolescents, particularly in the past five to seven years, as things like kinky sex and anal sex have been popularized, not just in the movies and the culture, but through sex ed. Now we have inclusive sex ed, which treats anal sex, oral sex, um, no, normal sex as all normal. It's just a matter of what appeals to you and, and whether you give consent. So she talks about the injuries to young girls and young women who come into her office because yes, they've given consent to try something to please the young man they're with. And he's watched something on porn and he thinks in porn they all look like they're having fun. And so he asks these young girls or he pushes a young girl to do something that physically damages her body, just physically damages her body. But our culture would look at that and say, but wait, she gave consent. How can we have a problem with that? If she gave consent, that's, that's her thing, right? That's her thing. Not true. What else are we seeing? We're seeing this, this culture of, of consent changing the way we view things like pornography. And so it used to be when I started looking at these topics, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that women had a strong reaction against pornography. They didn't like it. They didn't like it if, if their husbands or boyfriends were looking at it. They felt it was, for the most part, the majority of women felt it was degrading. And what's happening? Those numbers are changing, particularly in the youngest generation. Why? Because there's a steady narrative that says women are the boss of their bodies. Women can do what they want with their bodies. You can be a porn star. You can, you can engage in, in prostitution, sex work. You can do all these things as long as you give consent. Why should any man hold himself back? Isn't that all that matters? That there's been consent in that relationship. Well, here's the thing I want to pose to you. We're not just a bundle of physical assemblages, parts like Lego people. You know, we're human beings and we have dignity. And because we have dignity, we can't consent to things that are degrading because our dignity is inalienable. Remember that word, inalienable. That means it's in us. We have dignity no matter if, it, some, some of you might remember Les Mis, remember the, um, the young woman who was a prostitute. In her worst moment, she had dignity, no matter how others treated her. And so that's the first truth we have to realize and the first lie that we have to realize about the sexual consent culture. It's a legal minimum, fine. It is not any sort of a guide in terms of relationships. Relationships have to begin first by acknowledging there's another person I'm in relationship with. That person has a dignity that is inalienable, that I cannot degrade or transgress, even if she or he gives consent. That's why things like uh, violence, consensual violence, consensual watching and pornography. That's why those things can never be right. Consent doesn't make it healthy and wholesome. It doesn't make it morally good. And from a social science perspective, it does not contribute to human flourishing. And it will probably take another dozen years of many, many studies for people to, to finish proving that before people go on to something else. But the reality is, that's how we human beings are made. We have dignity. It's inalienable. I cannot consent to my own degradation. If it appears that I'm consenting, then whoever is, is about to degrade me has gotten a false consent. It doesn't matter. It's like we, um, I was reading about uh, 
women in India who are being, uh, or at least who had been until there was a change of law recently, who were being um, coerced into becoming surrogates because they were very, very poor women. They were uneducated. They were from these back villages. But someone would pay them to be inseminated with a man's, someone else's child, to carry that child. They had breeding farms in parts of India. And so these women were being exploited. Did they sign something, even though they couldn't read? Did they give their consent? Sure. But I would hate to meet my maker if I was the person who exploited those women. And that's the way we have to look at this. It doesn't matter whether someone, quote, gives consent. If something degrades the person, if something is not loving towards the person, you can't do it. Because that's not how we treat human beings. So where does the throwaway culture come into this? Well, I'm going to share with you two stories that I think show that our culture is kind of perhaps sneaking up on the truth about human dignity and the, what that means for human relationships. Uh, just this week, a writer for The Atlantic, Caitlin Flanagan, was writing about the whole situation with Matt Lauer. And, you know, he's been exposed as having engaged in well, allegedly rape and, and certainly a lot of sexual harassment and, and um, abuse of power relationships. And, and so Caitlin's writing about this and, and she's grappling with it. And she's, she can't quite get her head around the fact that this, this um, network, NBC, that, that hosted the Today Show, that seemed so friendly to women, seemed to care about women, turned its back and paid no attention to the fact that Matt Lauer had, quote, a woman problem. And she just, she's just grappling with it through this article. And then she says, finally towards the end, she said she'd come to the conclusion that at NBC, the ethos of respect was fraudulent because women don't matter very much. A throwaway culture. A throwaway culture treats people as things to be used as things that are expendable, as women or men who don't matter much. And so she's, she's coming to that realization that the core is much deeper than consent because in some of these situations where he was involved with women, even after what was clearly an abusive interaction, these women engaged in, in what appears to be consensual relations with him. So how do you get your head around that? It's because of that deeper truth. The, the culture there viewed these women as really not worth much at all. The throwaway culture. Use them, throw them away. There was another story that struck me. A, a woman who is a high-profile uh, high PR executive a number of years ago um, lost her parents and her three children in a terrible house fire. I think it was in Connecticut. And just, she was in the house and managed to escape, but literally just watched as her house just went up in flames and, and her children died, her parents died. And, and people said to her, how did, you, how did you get through this? And, you know, there's a lot of factors that came into play, but one of the things that emerged out of her pain was this conviction, a deep conviction, that people are not things that people matter. And so as a PR executive, she said, I am going to create advertising that does not exploit women, that does not sexualize women, that does not treat women as things. And so again, she's not coming at it from a faith perspective. I don't think she could explain sort of the dignity of the human person, the idea that males and females are made for each other and, and certain kinds of sex are, you know, exploitative if it's not in a, a relationship of love and permanence and fidelity. I don't think she's got any of that. But what she has is a truth, that people are not things, and that to the extent our culture thinks it's okay to treat people as things, that's a problem. And that's not something that any of us should want to cooperate in. And so she personally took her professional expertise and said, I'm going to do what I can to change that. Because I know deeply 
that people are not things and that sh people should never be treated as things. So perhaps we're stumbling onto things. You know, in David Daleiden's exposure of the, you know, the abortion trafficking in baby parts, I, I think people have sort of recoiled and had to think about, about what that all means. What does it mean? What kind of a throwaway culture are we when bodies go to the dump or get sold as spare parts and experimentation? What does that mean? So all of this is challenging us to think about who we are differently, to think about sex differently, to step back and say, how much am I infected with that, with that mindset that sees a sexual relationship as something where I get, not about respecting the dignity of the other person, about there being a meaning to this coming together, a meaning that expresses love, that says, I'm giving myself to you, a person, and you're receiving me, a person. It's not a transaction. It's not between two things and you, you go on your way as long as you've, you've signed that consent contract. It's a deeply personal interaction. And the only thing that, that is worthy of that is the kind of commitment that a person makes to another person for life with their, their, their whole selves, the totality of their being, their fidelity, their just giving of themselves. When you give a gift like that, you don't give it part way and you don't take it back. And you can't do that in a casual relationship. And that's why, you know, the, in, in these articles, the women, are com women in particular are complaining about bad sex. They used all sorts of profanities, but why? Because you know what? If it doesn't engage you at your deepest level, it's just a thing. It's just a thing you're doing. And it's deeply unsatisfying because sex is meant to be something more. It taps into who we are and we engage another person at that deepest level. And so the, the meaning behind that is so tremendous that it can only occur in that kind of a committed relationship. So is sexual consent and consent culture good? Well, it's a legal minimum. You know, you don't, you don't want to not have it. But it's not the measure of a relationship. And in fact, if that's where the conversation ends, we're missing a whole lot about who we are and about what sex means and what human flourishing means and the potential, our own potential for happiness. So some things to just take with you. A person is never a thing to be used. A person is worthy of love. Only love. Not being treated in a degrading way, not being, not being used, not being exploited even with consent. A person is worthy only of love. And that takes a lot, that takes giving. Because you, you can't love someone just by sort of standing back and measuring and, and evaluating. It's, it's a giving, it's an engagement. So what does that mean for all of you? How, do you? how do you counter a culture that's built on a minimalistic view of who we are and what, is, what sexual relationships are, are all about? I think, um, let me give you an ABCs. So first, be aware, A, be aware of others' pain and the woundedness. You know, I, I talk with women across, mostly women across the country in all, di all different ages, all different circumstances. And there is so much woundedness around sexuality and around relationships. We do it to each other. You know, that's because we're human beings and we need forgiveness, but we need to orient our lives towards the truth and towards what love really means. So be aware of other people's woundedness and pain. Never think you're better than someone else because you haven't experienced that. Thank God. And then say, how can I help? How can I help? How can I be attentive? What does this person need? Second, be bold. I find the biggest, um, the biggest thing that's holding the truth back in terms of its presence in society is that people who believe the truth will not speak it. People who believe the truth will not find a way to communicate it. They will not offer it. That's the equivalent of having in your back pocket, you know, the, the most sumptuous loaf of bread, and you walk by a starving man who's trying, who's gnawing at a rock, and you just sort of, eh, 
I'm not going to engage. You have the truth. Be bold and offer it to others. And then the question is how? That's the C, A, B, C, with charity, with charity. You cannot, you cannot lead wounded people to the truth by just preaching at them, by failing to hear and understand their pain, or by just you know, putting out there the rational argument. Be kind, first of all. And I can tell you it's just a beautiful example. I work a lot on uh, gender identity issues and, and transgender issues, and there's sort of a, a really wonderful coalition that has emerged of radical feminists we agree on nothing except the fact that sexual difference is real. Men and women are different. And for many of these women that we're working with, or some, I shouldn't say many, but, but certainly some of the ones that I've encountered, they have never met a real Christian. They have had only in their heads a caricature of what a Christian must be like. And so as we've engaged on this issue, it has been just tremendous to see the conversations to see the openness to begin to discuss other things, or at least to regard someone with whom you deeply disagree about you know, issues that are important to you, to regard them as a human being with dignity, someone to be cared for, someone who you would lay down your life for if it came to it. And I see that emerging because of the willingness to have these conversations in charity, in kindness, so let me leave, leave you with this, just the reminder. What our world needs now is the truth, the truth about who we are, that we are created with dignity that nobody can take away, and that we can't even alienate ourselves, that each one of us is a human being to be cherished. So that's the first truth. And second, there's a meaning to our lives. And that meaning is found in love. And love is not transactional. Love is a deeply personal encounter. It's a commitment to the other and a giving to the other. That's the truth that our world needs. You know, and I'm a Catholic. I'm a, a person of faith. So I would go a step further and say they need the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one who helps us see our own dignity, who helps us understand who we are, in spite of our woundedness, who gives us that example of love and what love truly means. But even if someone's not, not, in, uh, you know, not a believer, certainly they can see in your own actions the value of who they are and that they're made for something better and that they can do, they shouldn't hold out for just that minimalistic standard of sexual consent, but to hold out for love. Thank you very much. Thank you.